So we have uh, some time for discussion, and uh, please, Menachem, you there. Please. Mm -hmm. You, no, no. I, I, this was fascinating. I, I never, never realized that the Mishnah was, was, was uh, deemed to be kosher by the church at the same time that the, the, the Babylonian Talmud was, uh, was condemned and censored and burned. And now, could it be that the Inquisition were onto something slightly more profound than anti-Christian polemics? Um, and, and, and that they somehow, or, or even supersessionism, but, but that they some, somehow recognize the profoundly subversive nature of the Talmudic discussion of the Mishnah. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Talmud is representing a, religiousy, a, a religiosity of um, not of ambivalence, of an ambivalating discussion of all truths and all halakha. Okay, and, and if I'm right in that, then maybe your call to reclaiming ambivalence in Judaism is not merely ambivalence towards Christianity, but, but a reclaiming of the Talmud, again, in the form of, an ambiv of a religion comfortable with constant dialogue pluralism and, 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 and a deliberately ambivalating attitude towards everything it inherits, inherits from former generations? I, 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 well, uh, it's, a, it's a huge question. About the Mishnah, uh, I didn't observe it. And the, the, it's more interesting because you didn't have a Mishnah as an autonomous text before. That's something that Dusman already showed, but you never had them. only you after the, the after the invention of print, uh, you have a Mishnah as a separate text by itself. We used to world of there Mishnah. No, there are no Mishnah manuscripts. Three, all of them from one region in Italy. Three from all all generations. They are manuscripts of interpretation of of Maimonides, but not but not then. About the ambivalence, I. No, that, but then one second. So, so the, there isn't a Mishnah, but these codifications, right, of Maimonides and, and Caro, a sort of modern Mishnayot, and, yeah, okay, and the Talmudic okay, no, okay, attitude no, no. towards yes, them I, would then that's be another lecture. Yes, definitely. Safed is based on the Mishnah. The, it, that's why it was suppressed in Zionist culture. Safed is based on, present a different model of Jewish existence in Palestine. To, uh, the land that is imagined is after the destruction, not before. Zionism is going to Joshua, and Safed went to post. Uh, that, that's another issue. But the issue of ambivalence towards Christianity, I think it's crucial. It's the denial of, it, it, uh, and, and I don't have time to, to deal with it. You are right. I mean, it's not contradict each other. But there is, it's a precondition, and think about it, until we got today to this popular disturbing Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo-Christian issue. You, 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 you wouldn't think about any earlier Jew who will talk about the Judeo-Christian civilization, but this is the foundation of it. More than that, I think, will be too much. Okay. Maybe we'll collect a few questions, because I see a lot, and then uh, we will, maybe some of the questions will be solving themselves. So we will start with you, <laughs> and then uh, continue with Lauren Daston and then you. And we will finish with you, Ruth Gabizon. Uh, a comment to each of the three uh, speakers, please. Uh, first, Professor Guren Grich. Thank you. Um, your, your claim of democracy <laughs> that can allow for pluralism is based on a series of choices that can be realized through thought, choice, and reason, but that's a big assumption. Okay. To Professor uh, Karkotskin, the printing of the Shulchan Aruch was in an Arab world. The burning of the Talmud was in a Christian world. Mm -hmm. Two different worlds, two different uh, play, uh, playgrounds. Uh, number two, the Shulchan Aruch 
is generally dated at 1520, 1550, like that. That is the classical beginning of what we call achronim. Until then, it was rishonim. Indeed, what you say, it's a change in the, uh, in, in the understanding and in the perspective of histography and also in study of Talmud, not halacha, study of Talmud. And number three, the Shulchan Aruch can be seen as a good change. After all, it's all in a cookbook. You got it. It can also be seen as an intellectual minutia, no longer having to know text and Rishonim in order to reach halacha. Very serious criticism. To Professor Lerner, I comment, spirituality should not be, uh, and, be and certain behavior should not be confused with religion. Religion is based on faith. And spirituality is something completely different. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to. A question for Galen. Um, what do you think the cultural preconditions are? for an atmosphere of persuasion as opposed to coercion. Culturally and historically, this is the great anomaly. Um, could it be that what you call the pluralist predicament is one of those preconditions, and indeed the separation of church and state is also one of those preconditions? Thank you. Also, also for Galen, uh, Galen, the title of your presentation was Pluralism revisited a new world view of religion and public policy, but I don't remember hearing many comments or any comments on religion and public policy. Pluralism revisited a new world. You were focusing on America, the new world. Do you have any comments on religion and public policy? That's my question. Thank you. And no, no, the, to Ut. I was intrigued by the. Three, uh, the relationship between the t uh, three speakers, and I, 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 I wonder about modernity. I mean, to the first speaker, I, mean, I share your criticism of public reason and uh, and uh, and roles, and you seem to suggest that it's important to include religion in public reason rather than exclude it from public reason as part of a worldview that talks about public debate in democracy. But nonetheless, you accept that public debate in a democracy is premised on rash rationality and reason. It's not only, it's not, it's not connected to passions, to preferences, to all those powers that we think are part of society and needs to be reflected in a stable democracy. So, so are you really saying that we can build a theory about decision making in democracy, including religion, that is based on rationality alone? And I think this goes back to the, the question of the, the amazing question of, of cultures. Because I think that Israel, in a sense, is a laboratory of how it deals with different cultures. And the Soviet, post-Soviet elements that you are describing that are indeed very interesting, I think are raising a very important question that you may be raising, and which is, is there a cultural, a deep cultural structure to Judaism? Is it a civilization in the sense of a comprehensive sense that makes us able to make decisions about the world from within a particular framework? Or is it just a history, a folklore, something like that? I think it raises very, very serious challenges to the way Zionism sought to bring Judaism back into some kind of a modern aspiration. And burning of texts is very, very important in the sense that it raises the question, is there a cohesion of culture that, for instance, is Jewish and suggests that public reason in the Western 
Christian world is different in its presuppositions than the way you are thinking about society, state, God, in say the Middle East or Judaism or Islam or anything else? Because I thought this was part of what we were trying to find if there is something deeper in these cultures that bring into the meeting of these groups something that is not just the holidays or the language or the secularism versus religion, but something that is deeper that makes the kind of democracy we can have in Israel may be more vulnerable or more creative than it would be in a country in which the cultural infrastructure is possibly a bit more similar, less divergent. Okay, thank you. Uh, just the last question and then to Julia. Uh, thank you for, uh, I mean, thank you for the whole fantastic three uh, papers, but I was, I learned a lot from yours and I had no, no before, so I know some of his ideas and, and uh, anyway, <laughs> there we are. Um, what I, I'll give an impression, and I hope you can comment about it and either correct me or uh, uh, elaborate on it. I feel that there's like sort of a paradox that you describe, mm -hmm. where the, um, the Russian immigration to Israel is both sort of counter-modern in the way that it undermined the modern vision of the melting pot. It's big, it brought sort of a kind of a group uh, or a was part of a, a, a defragmentizing the, the political Israeli arena to uh, ethnic groups. It was part of that. It was not the only one. There were other before, but that kind of gave it um, a, a, a greater impetus and to, to become a, a, to disintegrate this scene. And at the same time of this mm -hmm. integration of modernity, it's Mainly, it, it sounds as if they are the last Soviet Russians uh, still uh, holding to some kind of a, a general Soviet Russianism without, and especially in Israel, we don't differentiate between Lithuanians and Moldavians and uh, Russians and Belarusians. They're all, for us, especially the natives, they're all Russians and we sort of project it and they project back this sort of a, a Russian speaking uh, or Russian related to the Russian language uh, uh, arena. So at the same time, the kind of upholding uh, uh, still the, the modern vision of a, uh, of a large uh, state, of the modern state, national state, the, uh, in a certain sense, at the same, and while they're fragmentizing the modern state, they are mm -hmm. a part of the fragmentation mm -hmm. of the modern state they are living in. That's kind of... I hope I was. Okay, so each of the speaker in the, like, in yeah. I would be the, you want me? Yes. No, I'll do it in one minute. I no, give because you. I, I supported Judaism. It's, uh, I need 50 seconds. <laughs> uh, first, I will start, but uh, in one comment, not about Achronim and Rishonim, because this is indeed, there is a revision in this issue. Just that the Shulchan Aruch was indeed uh, uh, written in the Muslim world, and only now we talk about the impact of, uh, of the Muslim world on, on, on 16th century uh, Safed Jews. But it's inter what is interesting is it was, print it was written between 55 and 58, 15, 55 to 58, but it was published in Venice for the first time in 1565. Why I, I mention it? Because it's amazing, because as if he was waiting for the index of trend because it was realized by him that if it will be published in the Ottoman Empire, it will not become universal, namely to the entire uh, Jewish world. And he kept in Safed of the 16th century, in Ein Zaytun, in fact, for several years, the manuscript of, uh, of the Shulchan Aruch. I mean, it could be, I don't think that he had many copies. So that's something, uh, that, that's one thing, but it brings me to, uh, to, to say that indeed, uh, Caro established what we can call imagined community, but definitely not national one. 
Yes, I, definitely it is not a, a, nation, a national uh, community on the contrary. It's a community of law that is applied to different cultures. Because in each culture, because this is, uh, I mean, the same kosher laws apply to different teachings, uh, 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 if you wish. And of course, I will not answer you what is uh, Judaism, but I will just say, because it's related to what we heard here, about the difficulty of the very distinction between religion and nationalism when we talk about the Jews. In fact, it was not, it was imposed on the Jews as part of the, of, of the establishment of the secular order. And when Jews were asked first by Napoleon uh, about this issue, uh, they, they didn't know what to do. So. Uh, they, they were a people, which is a, 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 a discussion. They were a community, but they, did, but they were neither. Not, it's not that they were neither. And this is why it is still difficult to define Judaism today as a religion, namely in the modern sense of privatization. And that's why the problem is not a division of, uh, the, the, the division of church and state in Israel, but more, most importantly, nationalism and state, or to be more precise, messianism. Uh, political messianism and, uh, and, and nationalism. And, 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 and the problem of sep the separation of church was a problem for the Jews because it, dem it, it demanded uh, 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 to, 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 to reduce Judaism into the private sphere according to uh, Christian elements. And, and, and this is a continuous problem. I used to know, I think that the main issue here uh, with, is, is the notion of exile and the question of law, but how to define it, I don't know. Thank you. Please, Gail. So is a democracy that is based on reason and deliberation and is public debate that is based on rationality a tall order? Obviously. Which is why, as Whitehead put it, the goal of education has to be for each citizen to attain what he describes as a philosophic outlook. That is both the goal of a democracy and it is what you need fully to inhabit a democracy. But what are the other options? And if you say, unless citizens are fully capable of articulating their comprehensive commitments in terms of a political purpose and articulating them in ways that justify those political purposes in terms that people who disagree with their comprehensive commitments can understand, which is a very tall order as well then it's hard to even have a conversation uh, when people don't share fundamental commitments. To Professor Daston's point, um, yes, the preconditions of persuasion would be the pluralist predicament and the separation of church and state. But again, the question would be those both, in my view, indicate the presence of a democracy, but they're also uh, the terms on which one can establish a democracy. The separation of church and state as it's practiced in the U.S. does pose a problem when it comes to religion and, and the public arena, in part because, and in the U.S. I talk about it in terms of moral capital. If you say that the institutions, the public institutions, cannot make religious claims or embody religious commitments, the presupposition is that that domain of human endeavor uh, is taken care of elsewhere. And in the US, it was widely assumed that everyone went to mostly church. And that's where you figured out not what it meant to be free, but how to wisely use your freedom. So if the job of the state is to make sure everyone is maximally free, and if the job of the religious institutions are to make sure that freedom is used wisely, what happens if no one no longer goes to church or synagogue or mosque? What is the source of moral capital? And the answer, the institution that will fill that vacuum is the market. And in my view, um, absent any 
engagement in the public arena of our comprehensive commitments, our deepest held moral values, we simply advocate the, sta the, the uh, space to uh, the media and the market. In my view, that's a, a recipe for disaster. It's not a problem-free solution. In fact, it's a terrible solution. It's just slightly less terrible uh, than the next worst one. So, there you are. Thank you so much. And please. Uh, first, to the first uh, question on uh, spirituality and religion, I don't know what, what is the exact basis uh, for your comment in my, in my talk, but, but uh, then I said the, the Russians become religious, I, I meant religious, not spiritual. Um, religious that, that people in the, in the last, you know, last surveys, people, uh, Russian speakers define themselves in, you know, in a, in a, in a regular, the usual uh, Israeli scale of, me, me, of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of religiosity, traditionalism, they define themselves as religious. And many of them indeed uh, adopted the, the religious way of life and practices. But more importantly, I'm an anthropologist. I don't work with the uh, uh, vocabulary definitions of uh, terms. And I actually I even don't care about them. I care about how people uh, understand them, that, what meaning they ascribe to them, how they see them, themselves and, and speak about themselves about, uh, in these terms, and how these terms actually also shape their ways of life and everyday practices. So I'm de dealing with phenomenology of the spirituality and religiosity and not with this, uh, uh, not with the uh, uh, vocabulary definitions, and I'm sure you know that in the new age, in the new age religiosity or in the contemporary religiosity, spirituality and uh, religion or religion, religious views on religious ways of life are very, very combined and actually co uh, exist uh, together and uh, very hard to um, to separate them. And, and, and not, thank only, you. not only Jewish religiosity. Of course. Christian. And, and since there are no Christian chaplains in the army, the, the, the eunuch rabbis uh, hand out New Testaments to the Christian soldiers for them to take their oath on. Which is so it's replaceable, kind of it's the same. And thank you very much for this um, paradox question, because there are a lot of uh, paradoxes about Russian, Russian presence uh, in Israel and Russian speakers in Israel. Um, uh, I'll bring you another one. Um, the, the, the biggest problem uh, of the Russian speaking in Israel is their uh, uh, questionable Jewishness. Yes, they are considered to be, for different reasons, not only for the ethnic one and religious, but also for cultural one, as a non-Jews. At the same one, they are considered to be one of the most nationalist and rightist and Jewish pro and pro-Jewish and pro-Israeli collective. Another, another paradox is uh, that they are extremely heterogeneous uh, collective that you, even in sociological terms, you hardly, it is even impossible to, to, uh, to study or to speak about them as a group. At the same time, there is a clear Russian identity that is uh, all always reproduced again and again, not only in the Israeli media and public discourse, by, but also among the Russian speakers themselves. So it's another paradox. So and the, this paradox that you mentioned, uh, that they, I like how you formulated it, they contributed to the ethnic defragmentation of the, of the, at least of the Jewish society, or at least of, this, of the political, the, the Jewish society on the political sphere, in the political sphere, and at the same time, they, um, they, they have this, you know, not a fantasy, maybe the kind of, a, they, they bring their contribution to the consolidation of uh, national, uh, you know, the strong st state. Um, I think two things, I, two, two points I have to say to, to, to respond here. Um, I, I was not a student of uh, Rivkas, I was a student of uh, another great teacher, Shmuel Noah Heisenstadt. Mm -hmm. And he taught me that uh, civilizations, and it also goes to Nono maybe, are always built on contradictions. So the civilizational cultural repertoires are always combines different and paradoxical tendencies. 
And I truly believe that the Soviet culture, political consciousness, I don't know how, but maybe if we know, you know, if we look in Israel, we can understand how they succeeded to build a kind of a civilization that sometimes, you know, described as a homo Sovieticus, that was full, that was built on many contradictions. Yeah? The, the political and cultural and civil conception, uh, the Soviet conceptions, includes both the universalistic and international view and the very strong nationalist one. Yeah? They were promoted and established concomitantly in this way of thinking and living. Um, I'm in a minute, I'm finishing. So, coming to Israel, Russians have a very complex cultural, uh, um, cultural baggage that they actually used and contribute both, both to, to, to the both uh, uh, tendencies in this sense. And um, more generally, I could say that I believe that immigrant group, how big it will be and how strong it will be, it will never bring the total change, the absolutely new ideas, you know, to the whole society, even Russians and Soviets, even if it is very authoritative. And, but Potentially, it, it can give strength, a very huge and very, uh, you know, zrika, <coughs> it's kind of a, to the existing tendencies. And then during the 90s, and then the, during the 90s, and even, even until today, Russians contribute to the two very strong, um, very strong uh, um, political and social tendencies that were actually already existing in the, in the Israeli social and the political sphere. One is the ethnic fragmentation, and Russians learned only in Israel that they are actually an ethnic community. Russian Jews never knew they are an ethnic, and they didn't exist as an ethnic community in the Soviet Union, yes? And another tendency, the nationalist, the nationalistic tendency, I would say, they, they, another time, they, so they contributed to both of them. Yes, they are. Yes, I will finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs> we reconvene at five. We have some time for coffee, a short coffee break. <laughs>